Hello, everyone, and welcome to our barbecue in the USA Hangout on Air. We're here to talk about all things Q, and we're very excited to have representatives from the Food Network and the Cooking Channel joining us today, as well as a handful of barbecue enthusiasts. So my name is Jackie Wasselcheck from Zagat, and I'll be leading the discussion. First off, I'd like to welcome Roger Moking, joining us today from Toronto. And this talented man is the host of Everyday Exotic and My Man Fire Food on the Cooking Channel, as well as the co-host of Heat Seekers on the Food Network. So welcome, Roger. Thank you, Jacqueline. Appreciate it. And then next up, we have Robert Bleifer, the executive chef of Food Network Kitchens, joining us from New York. How are you? And so in addition, we're of course joined by some wonderful barbecue experts and enthusiasts. Starting with Noah, why don't you go around and introduce yourselves? Well, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be on the show, and thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm Noah Glanville with the Pit Barrel Cooker Company. Um, we're a family-owned business. We've been manufacturing the Pit Barrel for uh, a couple years now, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's been a good thing. We, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll get a chance to uh, expand on that. But um, we're out of Colorado, American-made company, and uh, living the dream. And next up, we have a man with a very interesting name. I'd like to hear more about Meathead. I'm Meathead from AmazingRibs.com. Uh, the uh, uh, survey services tell me it is the world's most popular barbecue and grilling website. And how did you get that name? Creative parents or? <laughs> oh, we're going back to the Archie Bunker years, but it just kind of stuck when I got into barbecue. And lastly, Robin. Hey guys, uh, good to see you. Uh, I'm from GrillGirl.com, and uh, you know I love. Pretty much throwing anything on the grill. I started a blog about five years ago, around the time I um, bought my husband a new grill and almost singed my eyebrows off. And from there, I've made it my charge to really um, do everything on the grill and try to inspire other other people to really um, get out there and and try to cook on live fire. And I do try to keep it healthy most of the time. <laughs> Great to have you all. And for anyone who's watching at home, feel free to join in the conversation by using hashtag BBQ in the USA. And feel free to ask any questions you have for any of our guests. So to get things started, obviously we know barbecue is a huge subject that brings everyone together. So what I want to know is what makes you want to be involved in, in barbecue and grilling? Uh, me personally, I like to eat, so it's like the the fastest trajectory from A to B. You know what I mean? What he said. <laughs> me too. You know, I'd say at the end of the day, a lot of it is just about you know I love to eat too, and I, I have a big appetite for a small girl. So I find that when I throw stuff on the grill, I'm usually the most satisfied. Um, everything on the on the flame has so much more flavor than anything else you can cook. And what do you think it is contributes to the community? Because the We Love Barbecue community is actually one of the largest on Google+. Plus. So what is it about grilling that brings people together? I think it's just communal. Like, there's something very primal about it. You know, it takes us back to, like, Zinjanthropus, man, Neanderthal <laughs> era, you know, where... We're like around a fire. We just discovered this new thing, and there's always a sense of discovery. And, you know, you open a fire before long, somebody pulls up a guitar and starts singing really bad songs. Somebody else is like twiddling a stick and putting marshmallows on it. I just think there's an instant sense of community that comes with the warmth that, that, that's generated from a fire and, and that community feel. You know, it's, I think it's just primal. Don't forget the beer. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking it was the bourbon there. <laughs> <laughs> and so Roger like you said people have been using fire to cook and smoke meat for ages but what are some of the more interesting techniques that you've seen while filming your show oh man people do all kinds of stuff you know so um, there's an Argentinian inspired uh, thing called uh, Infernio that I saw in Napa uh, inspired by Francis Malman he's a famous fire cooking guru from Argentina um, and he builds this thing. It's basically two planchas stacked to on top of one another, 
and they build a fire on top plancha and underneath the bottom plancha and in between is where they do the cooking so you know we've baked anything from pies in between there salt crusted fish I've seen a few different people use that technique um, and it's really cool it's like an outdoor oven you know it just takes a lot a lot of wood to keep it keep it going but once you get the temperature going you can really control the temperature and raise it and drop it it's pretty amazing has anyone tried that at home here? I've actually tried um, Francis Mallman's uh, Patagonia pita bread, but I didn't have quite the setup, but I think he's an amazing cook, and I love his recipes. <laughs> yeah, I'm busy negotiating with my wife to build one of those in our backyard right now. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck I, with that. I use the cast iron griddle, which is a sort of plancha, a lot just on my grills. Uh, comes in really handy, uh, particularly good for fish. Um, and a variety of other foods. Ooh, that's good. I like that. Yeah, sounds like good creative options. So not only in Argentina, which you just mentioned, but there's just a bevy of different styles and regional barbecue that we can talk about. And Zagat actually just had a survey, and we found out that 27% of respondents preferred a Texas-style barbecue, with 16% liking Kansas Kansas City. So I'm curious to know kind of what your favorite types of barbecue are when it comes to specific regions. You know, when I'm in Texas, it's Texas. <laughs> of course. Yeah, you so know, I, I, I think it's like a steakhouse. You know, you, some are great, some, some are better than others, uh, and it's kind of it, it's how it's served. You know, it, it really is. I mean, there's some phenomenal, everywhere you go, I mean, where, where you find it and it's good, it's good. I, I wonder how many of the respondents know what Texas barbecue really is and what Kansas City <laughs> barbecue really is. Because if you look, um, red barbecue sauce, sweet barbecue sauce is hugely popular, and that's the thumbprint of Kansas City barbecue. You don't find that on good Texas barbecue. No, Texans are very proud of the cows they raise, so they keep it really natural, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and Kansas City-style barbecue sauce, the sweet red sauce... Americans put it on everything. I mean, they put it on uh, chicken, on uh, pasta, you name it. Pizza. So, Mohad, what's your personal preference? Me? You know, they, they, I, I got to cop out. It's like, what's your favorite child? Um, I, 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 I really love them all. Uh, there are a few barbecue joints that I can list that are among my favorites. And one of them is Cooper's in Llano, Texas. Um, it's a great place. I'll bet you Roger's been there. Uh, it's probably a few other folks um, where they cook on um, huge pits, and uh, you can walk up to the, fi the final pit in the row and say, I want that piece of meat, and they'll hand it to you, and uh, you can, they ask you if you want uh, sauce on it. Their sauce is very thin and not sweet, and if you want sauce, they dunk it in the vat, and as the day goes by, that sauce gets better and better and better. Mm. <laughs> but of course, everyone thinks that the state they come from has the best barbecue. I mean, I'm originally from North Carolina, and of course, we think that we have the best barbecue. But I'm never going to turn down any barbecue, no matter what state it's from. <laughs> you guys do the tri-tip out there in Northern Cali like that, right? In California, they do. And I'm from North Carolina, so we're all about pork. Uh Pork. Okay. Yeah, I'm in California. Sorry. Try, I, try tip. I'm I'm originally from California, so I take a lot of heat being out here in Colorado. But uh, you know, try tip I think is huge. It's definitely making its way across the United States, and uh, you know, people have a lot in the poor man's uh, sirloin, a lot of different things. But I think try tip is going equally as big uh, on the East Coast as it is on the West Coast. Just give it some time. But it is amazing. I mean, anyone who hasn't had it has to try it. Yeah, no, it's really, it is really spectacular, no doubt. But I love that you go, that when people do goats and stuff like that, too, you know, like you can do asado style on the cross over the fire and you do the goats or all kinds of stuff, man. It's incredible like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. So it sounds just, like, oh, go ahead, Robin. I was just going to say my barbecue team this year at Memphis and May, we did goat um, sliders for our exotic. And, of course, we didn't place that well, but it was pretty tasty. I, I should have been judging. I would have. I would have judged you, good girl. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to hear you say that because I've been begging for an event here up at Food Network where I'll be allowed to serve goat sliders. I've been begging. Nice. I'll send you the recipe. I'm Thanks. sure you'll tweak it. <laughs>
So, Robert, I'm sure that you've done a lot of traveling through Food Network and on your own time. So, do you have any favorite spots for barbecue across the U.S.? Yeah, I spent a lot of time down in Kentucky, and uh, Juicy's Barbecue just outside of Louisville is a place that every time I'm down there, I have to make sure I hit. But, I mean, no joke, wherever I'm traveling, if there's good barbecue, that is my favorite place for barbecue. Really? Ooh. Now, are you talking whole hog barbecue, chopped? Uh, well, sadly, down to Juicy's, it's pretty much, you know, butts and ribs. But, yeah, I mean, if you give me the opportunity to go somewhere where it's the whole hog, uh, my when I got married, I had to do a two-part thing, one up here in New York and the other one down in Kentucky, and I found someone to do a whole hog for me. Nice. Happiest, happiest moment of my life was watching that rig getting pulled behind the trailer, oh. smoking over the horizon. You got to go check Rodney Scott in Hemingway, South yes. Carolina, just yes. outside of Charleston, man. He's cra is the best whole hog I've eaten, and I had quite a bit yet, you know. Nice, and he's super sweet too. Good yeah, guy. Yeah, super sweet. Nice guy, right? Yeah. yeah. No, he comes out every year for the Big Apple Barbecue in New York, and he's just a pleasure. Oh, I love that guy. I love that guy to death. He's the sweetest man, and it makes good, delicious barbecues. What more can you want? Let me just jump in for a quick second. We were talking about tri-tip, and I get questions about this all the time. It's a cut of meat that made its name in s Southern California, and as uh, it was said, it's working its way around the country. People often go to their butcher, and they've never heard of it. Um, so if you want to try tri-tip, write this down. It's number 185C in the NAMP book. NAMP. That's the official butcher's guide. So if you go to your butcher and tell him you want 185C, <laughs> find it. That's nice. Interesting. I like that. I'm actually awesome. from Southern California, so I had no idea that it wasn't available elsewhere in the country because that was like my favorite growing up. It's really hard to find outside of California. Okay. Now I know, and now I know what to ask for when I go to my butcher. Thanks, Meathead. <laughs> It doesn't sound as sexy, though. Can I have a 185? It <laughs> <laughs> doesn't have a swag to it, you know? So we've talked a lot about restaurants, but, Robert, I know that you're in the Food Network kitchen. So is there any sort of favorite recipe you can share that people might be able to take with them home? Um, I, I guess, sadly, I don't usually work from a recipe. Um, I certainly have my patented dry rub, but I love just take a pork butt, Give it a good dry rub. Let that sit on there for a good hour or two while you're getting your fire hot. And then low and slow, lots of good hardwood on there to get the smoke really pumping through. You know, get get that thing going for a good five hours. Let it rest before you rip into it. And then hopefully you have that bacon-like skin on the outer layer and that nice juicy meat in the middle. Suddenly what kind, of, very what kind of wood are you using? What kind of wood are you using, bro? Uh, well, half the time, that all depends where I am. I mean, in my garage right now, uh, I've, I have uh, oak, hickory, and uh, cherry. But, and anything that's going to smell pretty. That, that's, that's hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned dry rubs. Um, there's a bunch of them for sale in stores. And, you know, McCormick makes them and also on websites. But I'd really like to encourage uh, listeners to try making their own. It's, it's a lot less expensive. Most commercial dry rubs are primarily salt. Um, and uh, it's pretty easy. I've got some recipes on my website. I'll bet you Robin does too. Um, they're not hard to make. Um, you don't want to use the same rub you use for pork as you do for beef but um, uh, or, or seafood. But they're really easy to make and a lot cheaper that way. And you can customize them then and make it to your own taste. Absolutely. Meathead, I really echo your sentiments. Um, I'm all about making my own rubs. And, um, you know, one of my – what I'm really into right now is, like, smoked sea salt and smoked paprika <laughs> and smoked brown sugar um, and, of course, like, a coarse smoked black pepper. And that, you know, I'll put that in a rub. And it's great on just about everything, you know. Um, so I really just, like you said, I think you can really get creative and really kind of play to your own palate. But um, then you really can control salt. And also, a lot of times, these rubs might even have MSG. And you don't really need that. So I'm, I'm all about, you know, au natural and, and doing your own. Well, if you're brining, too, you don't want all that salt in your rub. But I like the idea of smoking all the herbs because then you can use them indoors and bring the flavor of outdoors to indoor cooking. Ah, so you Absolutely. don't just look like Jerry Garcia. You like to smoke the herbs. <laughs> <laughs> I was on to you, bro. Uh -oh. I was on to you. 
Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, and for me, when I make my dry rubs, I never put salt in the rub. I want to be able to control the amount of salt I'm putting on the meat. Yes. And then I'll get the rub on there. And, uh, Robin, you hit it for me. Smoked paprika is one of my favorite ingredients to appear in the last, you know, 20 years. I can't live without it. And especially, you know, I, I don't want to make everybody out there shudder. If I ever have to use the gas grill and I can't break out the Ooh. charcoal, uh, smoked paprika is going to just be slathered on everything to at least make somebody think that there was some real wood happening in well, there. Well, and they're easy to make. They're easy to make from scratch. Even if you don't have, don't want to do it from paprika, paprika, you can just take sweet bell peppers and smoke them, and dry them and grind them. I do that with um, uh, jalapenos and make my own uh, chipotle every year and we've got a whole variety of peppers out there and I just smoke them and dry them. I just did some smoked sun-dried tomatoes last week from little cherry tomatoes, sliced them open, smoked them when they were desiccated but not completely hard, still pliable. Fabulous on salads, pizzas. Yeah, full of good tips, Mina. I'm impressed. Um, so, Robin, while we're on the subject of recipes, I know that you tend to cater some of yours towards a more health-conscious crowd. So, it's summer, tons of people are grilling barbecue. Do you have any particular kind of tips or recipe that you'd share? You know, um, I, you for a crowd, one thing I really love to do, and I think that people always find this kind of like a fun thing that's different and they haven't heard of, is a spatchcock chicken. Um, and, you know, you can buy a whole chicken pretty inexpensively, have your butcher cut the backbone out, um, and then I'll make um, a marinade and, you know, really just slather it underneath the skin and you grill it underneath a brick to get the, the skin really crispy. And you can feed, you know, a pretty good crowd with this. And then I'll throw it with, like, some grilled romaine and, you know, some grilled veggies, maybe even do, um, you know, I like to do grilled bread with compound butters and you know, the whole nine yards. But... Um, that's one of my favorites just because it's different and people haven't tried it before. And usually chicken's pretty, um, you know, it's it's one of the, the lower fat ones, I'd say, you know, and you can add a lot of flavor to it. I love doing a pork tenderloin, too, for a crowd because you can be, um, it just, you know, you can use a lot of different marinades or rubs. It, you know, the flavor really adheres to it well. And, you know, if it's a crowd, you can also slice the pork tenderloin and make sliders out of it, and then it'll really go that much further. Um, and, you know, it doesn't take forever to cook, you know. Um, and then, of course, there's always the, the meat on the stick aspect. I am a huge fan of skewers. Um, they do require more prep work in the beginning, but, you know, because usually the, the cuts of meat or uh, pieces of meat are smaller, once they're in a skewer, they'll grill pretty quickly so that, you know, you'll be done pretty fast, and then you can spend time hanging out with your guests. Because I don't know if you guys are like me, but a lot of times when I have people over, I end up cooking the whole time. And a lot of times I'd really love to be just hanging out with people and having a cocktail as well and, and enjoying my, my friends and family over. So so those are some of my favorite ones to, to throw out there. Robin, well, really, I, I know you cook on your sailboat. What do you cook out there when you're out there in Biscayne Bay? Um, That can be interesting. What did I do the last time? I'm trying to think. I've done skewers a lot. It depends on the size of the grill, and sometimes those are really small. I've done steaks. Um. I've even made breakfast on our boat. I, you know, as long as you have a cast iron skillet, you can really throw anything on that grill, which is which is great. I've made um, huevos rancheros on it. Um, we've camped on the boat, and uh, that's another story. But on a twenty-one foot sailboat, camping with your husband can it'll bring you close together. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, definitely sounds nice. It sounds like a good alternative to just being in your backyard. Yeah, so we've absolutely. talked a little bit about tools, but I'd be curious to know kind of what are some of the ones really active being used today? I'll tell you one thing I use, I use a lot, actually, speaking on the cast iron thing you were talking about, Robin. In Trinidad, we use a thing called a tawa. A tawa ah. is a, a round, flat steel plate. It's like cast iron steel, um, and it's what they make roti and chapati with, right? Nice. So I just put that on top, and I fry eggs. I make scones and biscuits, and like pancakes on there. I'll make grilled cheese, sear um, tomatoes, sear like I, I treat it like a griddle, you know. So get a crust on some bison loins and all Yum. kinds of stuff. But it's a it's a tawa for actually made for roti, and I tell. Trinidadians that I do all this wacky stuff with it and they look at me like I'm crazy, you know? <laughs> I love it. Yeah, well, I, I, I gotta jump in on the tool question. 
absolutely the most important thing you can get, the best way to amp up your outdoor cooking, to make your food turn out better, are the new digital thermometers. Um, there is just a whole fleet of them. You can get a really good digital thermometer for $25, a meat thermometer or a food thermometer. Um, and I mean, if you're cooking a steak, medium rare is 130 to 135. You don't have to cut it open to look at the color. You just stick it with a thermometer. You get a reading in four, five, six seconds, and you know exactly what your temperature is. Steak's expensive. There's no reason to overcook it. Chicken is often contaminated with salmonella. There's no reason to make your family and guests sick. Um, and also, you can get oven thermometers. That dial that comes attached to your grill is a piece of garbage. It's the last thing they add to it. It's made at the cheapest factory they can uh, make it at in the Orient, and it measures the temperature in the dome, not down where you're cooking. And unless you plan to eat the dome, you don't need to know the temperature up there. You need to know the temperature down on the cooking surface. So you need those two things, and your, your cooking skills will uh, amp up overnight. I've got a buyer's guide to thermometers where I rate and review 100, not 100, maybe 75 of them. Go look at that and order yourself a couple of good digital thermometers. I second you on that, Meathead. I could not live without my Thermapen. I think it's totally worth the money, um, especially like when I've done my women's grilling clinics, you know, and women are like, how do I not overcook chicken or not undercook it? It's all about using a meat thermometer. I mean, why, why guess when you know? Um, and that's, that's one thing I really i am all about is, yeah, the Thermapen is awesome. Um, another trend I'm seeing, and I'm going to have to give you a plug right here, Noah, is People are really getting excited about the pit barrel cooker and just, you know, different types of grills out there. Um, and so um, I would say, you know, people are kind of getting outside of their, their comfort zone of your traditional gas or, or, you know, something you can buy at, at Home Depot and, and wanting to try new things, you know. Yeah, no. what inspired you to create the pit barrel smoker? Just, uh, just Robin's comment and, and the meat has... We install that on the barrel or not, and, and you have no idea how many age, and me that hits it right on the dot. You're not eating the top. You, know, you want to pay attention to what you're actually eating, and lost lost my earpiece. Uh, will make. And that is so important. And, and a good instant read digital thermometer, a thermopen, right in, and what uh, what did us pepper? I was in the middle, and I had said to my wife, if we really create something that is set it, get it, um, and take not just a step back, but but a few steps back, where barbecue is gone. Fancy things happen. I mean, we absolutely were passionate. We love the fact that we're creating some food um, with this a quarter, and you don't have to spend thousands of dollars to have. And that's something. And you know, whether you're a, a C as um, as uh, Fire before and achieve results that are um, absolutely amazing and something that's really exciting. It looks uh, like we might be having some technical difficulties on yeah. Noah's side. Yeah, but bad. We, sorry, Meathead. I said I can, I I can only hear every other word or so. Yeah, we will make sure to make his answers accessible because I think we all want to hear it. So yeah. we'll we'll be posting those. Pending his return, um, people who don't know the product, it is an old 55-gallon, actually I think it's a little small on that, but it's a, like an oil drum that they have created a very clever cooking system for, and um, it's very modestly priced. I think it's well under $200, and I, I know a couple of competition barbecue teams that are using it. Um, my equipment expert, I have a full-time guy who reviews grills and smokers. He's using a pit barrel cooker, and he loves the thing. 
Um, so it's a great inexpensive way to both grill and smoke. Uh, it's a hot new product. I've only heard of it maybe six months ago, but it's really caught a lot of people's attention. One thing to mention, too, is that um, Noah and John Dawson from Patio Daddio beat Johnny Trigg in ribs at a barbecue Yay. competition. And Johnny Trib Trigg is like the ribs king, so he's really getting some notoriety with that. Um, so you know, for people who are looking to try something new, I think that's a, definitely one to, to keep your eye out for. Um, so. Has anybody tried about the, the green egg or the big steel keg or anything like that? I have a big green egg, and I love it. Yeah, have you, and have when you, you tried get a big green egg, it's, I haven't tried that one yet. I've heard this that's is, good. Uh, this is a category that's among the hottest categories of, of cookers out there. There was only the big green egg about 10 years ago, and there must be 15 knockoffs out there. Um, they're called Kamados because they're sort of like the ancient Japanese Kamado. Um, the egg was the pioneer, although my favorite is one called Primo because it's oval shaped and it allows you to have a hot side and a cool side and I think that's really a crucial concept in uh, outdoor cooking is have a hot side and a cool side all the rest are round and it's hard to do that um, the that's other true. category that's really really hot right now are pellet smokers um, yes. they're, they're often called grills but they're not good at grilling um, you really can't get a good sear on a steak they're expensive but they're digitally controlled you can set it for 225 and walk away. Some of them have um, uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, where you can actually program it, cook at 225 for three hours, then raise the temp for, t for an hour, then drop it down and hold it at 170. I mean, amazing new technology. And they cook over little wood pellets made from sawdust. And uh, um, there was only like one or two manufacturers a few years ago, and now there's 15 or 20. Um, uh, one of my favorites is the Mac, M-A-K, but there's a whole bunch of those, and they're expensive. They start at 1000 bucks and go up. But, boy, talk about set it and forget it ease and well, delicious food. That's not food. fun, meathead, man. That's not fun. <laughs> it's like working in a hotel. It's like <laughs> you put on the auto shed and you just go, you know. It's like... The whole thing is you're supposed to be around the fire and hanging out with your buddies and yeah, but everybody leaves and you smell like smoke, you know? Like that's, so, that's sometimes you want to serve lunch at noon and you don't want to stay up till <laughs> all night long because you I'm put sorry, the meat on at midnight and you just don't feel like staying up all night tending nah, the fire. That's the fun of the game, man. <laughs> I have to echo what you said too, Meathead. You brought up some good points. A, when you, when you get a big green egg, this is another side of that, is that you really get into this community, it's almost like a cult-like following egg during heads. the eggheads. I have one, my dad has one. I mean, you know, you you get it, you know, and you're you're kind of a in a cooking community, and you know, part of the larger barbecue community as a whole. But also, what I'm seeing too, and especially even in the competition circuit, the pellet the pellet cookers are just so um, so much easier than like what me, might people might have with a stick burner, where they're much more temperamental, and you're having to load, you know, your your wood all the time. Um, people are doing really well on the competition circuit with pellet smokers. So. Yeah, but here's where I come down with Roger. In competition, mm -hmm. you need to be demonstrating your man fire management skills. Exactly. You need to be cooking with charcoal and wood. For backyard, and for me, I do recipe development, so I need to be able to tell people, cook at 225 for X number of hours. It's just a great recipe development tool. But um, it's cheating in competition. I agree, hundred percent. It's like you got to be able to man and stoke your fire. Oh, yeah. you man and stoke your fire. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we're about to kind of wrap up our conversation, but one quick question I wanted to ask you all is: It's obviously barbecue season. So, what are some of the biz biggest mistakes you see people executing when they're grilling, barbecuing, and what can they do to fix it? The number one thing I see all the time is people just put everything on high and they yes. put their stuff right on high on top of it, they think it's going to go faster. You know, like, know your heat, know your method, know what you're looking to achieve. Indirect heat and low and slow sometimes your is your fave. Sometimes you need to go hot and fast at the beginning to get a sear, then move it over indirect. So know what you're looking to achieve and what kind of meat you have. Absolutely. I would Temper say... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say it's all about cooking zones. You know, people think of gr grilling it or, you know, smoking is just like flame, meat, on, you know, but it's really like 
it's like an oven, you know, grilling is like broiling, um, you know, when you do indirect heat, it's like baking, so, you know, if you, if you think of it that way, you can really open up your ideas on how you might cook things and cook them better, you know, and do a better job and have juicier meat instead of the stuff that you cook the heck out of and, you know, and scared your friends with, so, um, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I have to say the same thing. You cook too hot, all of you out there. And you need to learn how to set up a two-zone system, a hot side and a not-so-hot side. Um, uh, sometimes you do want to cook hot. Thin skirt steaks, bang, hit them with heat. But anything thicker than an inch, you need to slow it down, ease it up. You need to learn techniques like reverse sear. Um, I have a number of articles on all these concepts that people can come look at um, on when to cook at what temperature. But it's all about temperature. It's all about control of heat. And uh, once you get a sense for the thermodynamics, um, you can really amp up your game. Yeah, and the other thing Roger touched on it at the end of his comment there is the cut of meat. You know, in addition to heat, obviously being the key thing, cut of meat, you get people trying to go low and slow on cuts of meat that should be kept mid rare at best. Uh, and other times, you know, going the other way, a, a cut of meat that has to go forever. People are thinking, oh, it's, it's cooked to medium rare. Let me get it off now, and it's you know borderline inedible. Yeah. Beef ribs. Take them <laughs> off medium rare. You're going to chew all day long. Yep. <laughs> I was in a restaurant the, the other day, and the guy's cooking short ribs, and he says, what temperature would you like your short ribs? Like, I picked up my stuff. I walked out, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. And please be sure to check out Roger's show, Man Fire Food, on the Cooking Channel, Mondays at 9.30 EST, 6.30 PST. And also visit Food Network's Grilling Central for some tried and true barbecue recipes at foodnetwork.com, in addition to checking out Grill Girl and Meathead's website as well. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Peace.